Since its inception, Toyota has prioritized the safety of forklift operators and pedestrians. Products like their proprietary Smart Environment Sensor Plus, aka Sense Plus, assist operators in identifying pedestrians or objects behind their forklifts. With features such as dynamic zoning, adjustable truck slowdown, and backward movement prevention, Toyota continues to showcase its innovative technology. Request a free demo by clicking the link in the show notes or head to toyotaforklift.com slash sense dash plus. That's S-E-N-S dash P-L-U-S to take the first step to making your operation safer today. The New Warehouse Podcast hosted by Kevin Lawton is your source for insights and ideas. From the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. And on today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Eric Nieves. He is the founder and CEO at Plus One Robotics. And we're going to dive into Plus One Robotics, who have just recently crossed their 1 billion pick milestone as well. We're going to talk a little bit about how Eric came to found the company, what they're all about. And we're going to dive into some of the, the future of warehouse automation, talk about some of that labor shortage challenges and how robotics and automation is addressing that. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of the intersection of AI and robotics too. And and why does that matter? And we'll dive into that with Eric today. So Eric, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Kevin. I've been looking forward to this uh, session. Oh, good. We got some excitement brewing. So that's a good yes, thing sir. here for the podcast. We appreciate that. And it's great to have you on uh, the show here. So so why don't we get kind of just an understanding first? Tell us a little bit about Plus One Robotics and, and tell us how you kind of came to to found this company because you've been in robotics for, for a long time in your career, right? That's true. You know, Plus One was born just from there was this... Uh, understanding that the warehouse was going to be the next major vertical to adopt industrial robotics at scale. Mm. You know, of course, even today, seven out of 10 robots sold are building a car part somewhere. Yeah, It's still very heavily indexed towards automotive and that heavy manufacturing. But when you sort of just look at the where the labor flows, where is you know, who is struggling to get labor? There's other pockets in the economy. Logistics is one. Agriculture, of course, is always, you know, struggling. Construction, uh, anybody who's trying to build a house understands, you know, just how yeah. <laughs> the lack of labor is there. So it could have been any of those things. But it was clear that the warehouse was not only a huge opportunity for automation, but in a lot of ways, it lent itself to the tools available, mm. right? I mean, the others that we're talking about, first thing, they're outside, right? And robots today don't like being out of doors. Warehouse automation obviously is under roof. There's other things that sort of make the technology more accessible to that. And so we knew the opportunity was there. But what was missing, the, the challenge that was presented me, and this was even when I was still at Yaskawa running R&D, mm -hmm. was, Eric, if, if the warehouse is such a ripe market for robots, why aren't there a thousand of them there today? Mm. And it's because there was a technology gap. And that gap was uh, vision, software, and grasping. It's not a robot arm problem. It's a perception and grasping problem. And you know, when you make that determination, well, then it's pretty easy to understand that, you know, that's not going to be solved by a robot arm company. Yeah. And so Sean and Paul, my co-founders and I joined forces to solve the perception problem for warehouses and to bring those industrial robots into bear. And we've been, you know, successful. We took our first check of, you know, venture funding back in 2017. Okay. So this is seven years in for us. Yeah. You mentioned the billion picks. That was what, I think, 
February of this year, sometime earlier this year, we crossed a billion picks and we'll do over a million picks today and every day. Mm -hmm. So the technology is being well received and adopted out in the market. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing. And I, I think it's such a, a good point there, as you mentioned, you know, the, uh, the hardware in a sense kind of has been existing there, but it's kind of that software backend type of thing as how do we take this hardware and, and utilize it in that, that certain way. And obviously you guys, you know, if you're crossing a billion picks and you're, you're doing a million a day, I think you just mentioned, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously you figured something out there, right? That's, that's working. So, I, I mean, I think it's very interesting, but even as you said, I mean, I, I think the, the penetration in the market for robotics and automation is still still kind of low if we look in the grand oh, scheme yeah. of things, right? So so talk to us a little bit about kind of that that future of warehouse automation now. I mean, as we as we look at it now, I mean, do you think that people are becoming more open to it and that's gonna increase the adoption? I mean, where are we? I guess let's start like where are we currently and where do you think we're evolving to in the next couple of years? Yeah. Uh, spot on. If we're doing a million picks a day mm -hmm. and we know how few robots we have in proportion to the other applications that yeah. are ahead of us in the warehouse, we could do a hundred million picks a day mm -hmm. and still have plenty of headroom, right? That's how early we are in this, you know, sort of emerging vertical. And, you know, what is it that that's going to catalyze continued growth here? One is we have to just accept it as ground truth that the warehouse is a reticent adopter of technology, mm. right? And it's true because it's also a high intensity domain. You've got to get this stuff shipped and it has to hit this window at this time yeah. or customers are going to be disappointed. So, you know, when, you, when you're in that mindset, Bringing in a piece of technology that's supposed to solve the, you know, problems is a risk. Mm -hmm. You know you can do it if you have enough labor, right? And I encourage warehouse operators every day. If you can get the labor you need to meet your volumes and your cutoff windows, please do. Mm -hmm. Because there is no more flexible, adaptable, you know, resource than people. The issue is if you can't, yeah. if you can't get those people, then what are you going to do? Uh, you're going to have to adopt this technology. Uh, what they want to see is more proof points in the world. Mm. Of course, we all do. Yeah. We want to see <laughs> that, hey, somebody that looks like me has solved their problems or addressed some of them by adoption of these new techniques. And when that happens, you sort of catalyze the market. So, you know, our users are all at the top of the market. Mm. We focus nearly exclusively on parcel post. So okay. it's, you know, FedEx, it's, you know, DHL, it's all the couriers. Anybody that shows up at your porch, you know, <laughs> bringing your packages for the week is likely a plus one customer. That's great. But there needs to be enough of them enough robots doing enough picks for enough time for everybody to say, ah, this is a vetted, proven, reliable technology. And then you're not at a million picks a day. Mm -hmm. You're at 10 million picks in six months. You're at 100 million picks in you know two or three years. It just continues to, to grow much more rapidly when everybody feels they have the proof. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's... There's still definitely, I you know, like when I talk to people and operators and stuff, I mean, there's still a, like a bit of skepticism around that, right? And, and when are things going to come about? I'm, I'm curious though, because it kind of lends itself. I saw, I think you, you posted something from a recent talk about, I think it was Stephanie from Penny Bowes, who we've had on the mm -hmm. podcast before, said to, you know, stop being so cautious around the the pilots right. basically and things like that. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think people need to maybe like rip the bandaid a little more, so to speak? They do. You know, I understand the stakes are high, mm -hmm. but we're getting to the place where there's enough evidence of, you know, success that folks should be in a position to move faster. You know, you're right. 
Stephanie, who uh, had the best use of onomatopoeia I've ever seen on a panel when she started talking <laughs> about the drip, drip, drip yeah. of pilots, right? Um, she's right. Uh, you know, what Pitney Bowes did was get to, you know, about 70% confidence mm -hmm. and then say, okay, do I believe in this team enough mm. that they'll get us through the other 30%? That's really the bet. Yeah. That's the bet. It's not so much the technology, it's the team behind it. And we'd inspired enough confidence in Pitney Bowes that by the time they got to 70%, they said, let's go. Mm. And we have multiple systems that Pitney Bowes across multiple facilities across their network doing meaningful work for them every day. You know, but Pitney is a bit of an outlier when it comes to let's just move and move quickly right but yes definitely time to say we're we're going to take a leap of faith and and jump more fulsomely into the technology but you know you mentioned this sort of reticence right that's part of the reason plus one is plus one right is this whole notion of the most important thing that robot does in the facility is keep running. Yeah. Right? It's got to be reliable. The uptime is crucial. And so plus one's approach is if you back up the 30,000 feet, what's the difference between manufacturing and logistics? Mm. It's manufacturing is all about repeatability and logistics is all about variability. Every pick, you know, you, you don't know what's going to come down the line next. So you have to discover everything every time. Hence, it's a perception problem, right? It's a software problem. Um, but as a software problem, our position is there will be occasions when this AI enabled, you know, high end software is going to disappoint you. It, there, there will be scenes so cluttered. There will be, you know, images so, you know, shiny or reflective or packages it's never seen. Who knows what? Mm -hmm. Variability is going to continue to happen. And sometimes that variability is going to exceed the capacity of the software to understand mm -hmm. at that moment. And so when that happens, the robot actually signals back to Texas and a crew chief, which is what we call the people that sort of manage the robots in the world, they get a ding and they see, oh, look, that robot is confused. Let me help it. Mm. And you do that remotely and you do that very quickly. And all of a sudden that robot's back to work. That interval, Kevin, from the time it said, I don't know what I'm doing till it's running again, yeah. is always under 10 seconds. Oh, wow. This is. This is hugely important to our users because it leads to this uptime. It means, hey, yeah, the robot got confused, but the truth is none of us on the floor even knew it happened mm. because it was kickstarted back into production so quickly and we didn't have to intervene physically in the facility. Mm. That's the plus one-ishness of plus one. Yeah. Is you <laughs> add this human being. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> You add this human being and all of a sudden you're driving a lot more reliability of the system, mm. right? Nobody wants a robot boat anchor sitting there taking up room and then have to put a human to work around it, mm. right? Yeah. So the robot, you know, it's the Hippocratic oath that she shall do no harm, mm. right? We cannot afford to, you know, impact rate or volume. So the robot has to keep running. This approach, this sort of people-centric, human-centric approach to the automation, right, is much more readily acceptable to an, a warehouse operator that's looking at how do I make sure that the mm. systems don't, you know, sort of just die on the vine, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it gives them a great sense of relief because you have narrowed the catastrophe gap in their mind. You, not in their mind. You actually have narrowed the catastrophe gap because without that sort of quick human intervention remotely, what do you got left? You got sneaker net. You got somebody walk out to the machine, figure yeah. out what's going on, 
you know all these robots, the vast majority of them are up on mezzanines. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to climb a ladder, figure out what went wrong, push some buttons, clear some stuff. It it all takes so long. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, you know, twice an hour and it costs you, you know, 18 minutes of downtime, what are we doing here? Yeah. Right? You have to be able to intervene quickly and remotely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's such a, a great key. And I think it's it's great that you guys have recognized that and, and focused on that too, to make that user experience even, even better. I'm curious in your opinion there, I mean, as we, you know, I think back when I started this podcast back in 2019 and, you know, there was a big discussion about the, the lights out warehouse, the dark warehouse, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Right. I mean, and, and I think a lot of, I see that a lot of that conversation has kind of disappeared in a sense. Right. So I'm curious your, your thoughts on that since you, you know, you have this focus where, you know, you're saying the, the plus uh, one ishness, uh, which you mentioned, yeah. I like that, um, yeah. you know, with still some of that, that human intervention involved. So I'm curious, you know, what, what do you think about that concept or that idea? I mean, is that something that's really realistic even to, to think about at this point is, is having a lights out warehouse? I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I, it's not that I don't even think it's realistic. It's that I don't think even if it were possible, you should do it. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you know, you're going to have boxed yourself in so much. You would have paid so much capital to have this, you know, fictitious lights out warehouse. Yeah. We have folks come to us, Kevin, on occasion with that notion. Mm. And it's pretty short conversation because I'm just not a believer in, you know, the dark warehouse. I am a human exceptionalist, frankly. You've heard me already say, if you can get people, yeah. please do. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you mentioned 2019 when you started the podcast. I think that was the year was it 19 or 2020, that the information mm. named Plus One one of the top 50 AI companies in the country, mm. right? We're not AI skeptics here. Every single system that we have deployed is running a robust AI model and you know one that adapts regularly over time. But even so, we're saying, hey, AI is not going to be sufficient. Mm. And this is sort of where Plus One diverges from other folks in the market, there's this tension between human exceptionalism, you know, heck, our, our whole model is robots work, people rule, Yeah. right, <laughs> um, versus AI first, AI only, mm. right? And it comes down to how do you view the warehouse? Do you view the warehouse as a systems problem or do you view it as a data problem, mm. right? Yeah. We're systems people. Mm. I would argue that there is nothing in robotics that isn't a systems problem. Okay. You have to be very mindful, not just of what the robot is doing, but what is happening upstream of you and how do you interface to what's downstream of you. Mm. That's not just data. That's engineering. That's you know uptime, reliability, all these other things we talked about. The other view is the warehouse is a data problem. And if we just feed enough images you know, to the robots and the sensors, the robots will teach themselves how to do the job and we can all go home. <laughs> the dark warehouse is predicated on this, is, is based on the warehouse is a data problem. Mm. But it isn't. And it can't be. So the kind of proof in that pudding is don't talk to the vendors of this technology talk to the consumers okay ask the warehouse uh operator ask somebody on the line you know do you have a data problem or do you you know do you think of your stuff as you know data or do you think of it as a system mm. they're all going to tell you it's a systems problem yeah right so you know when it's a data problem you don't have to worry about preventive maintenance mm. when it's a data problem you don't care about friction inertia heat any of that yeah right <laughs> The warehouse is not a data problem. Yeah. Optimization, network optimization, routing, all the stuff that are ones and zeros, data problems. Mm -hmm. AI can fully, you can have a lights out optimization routine, but you cannot have a lights out warehouse. Mm. 
So thou shalt have a human in the loop. Yeah. That's our view. One of the plus one commandments right there. Right. <laughs> Definitely. I, I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense because I, I, I see it challenging to to get to that point, even with, with some of the, the variability too, that you mentioned. I mean, I mean, you said that you get a, a shiny product and you know, it's now it's how do I, the robot's like, how do I handle this? Right. I mean, so I, I mean, I think it's very interesting to, to hear that perspective. And I, I think it's something that's if happening is, is quite, 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 far, far down the road, I would say, if anything. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, even we, we talked here about the, you know, the low kind of penetration in the market so far, just around robotics in general. I mean, you know, to, to get somebody to even like want to do that or, or feel comfortable doing that. I mean, I, I think, you know, us as warehouse operators, we're, uh, we're kind of a little risk adverse. We're a little cautious, you know, implementation, disruption are some of the, the dirtiest words probably uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> to the warehouse world. So I, I think it, it would be a huge challenge to even get to that point, if it even makes sense at, at some point to do it and, and can be efficient and consistent overall, kind of as you mentioned there. So yeah, very interesting perspective there. So now I, I'm curious, I mean, from the perspectives we've talked about kind of the, the future of warehouse automation and, and you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the plus one robotic applications are on mezzanines as well and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we look towards, you know, the, the future as well and, and people are starting to put, you know, robotics or automation into their, their operational roadmaps and their company roadmaps. And, you know, I'm, I'm in New Jersey here and they're building warehouses like crazy around here still where yeah. I'm at. And I, I mean, as people look to, you know, the future of their buildings, the future of their facilities, I, I mean, how do you advise or, I mean, are you seeing too? I mean, I guess in a sense where people are building out these warehouses with not necessarily putting automation in right away, but making sure that the building, the facility itself is prepared to be able to have automation at some point. Yeah. I mean, this is a whole brownfield, greenfield, yeah. you know? I've just seen instances of where you have a brownfield, they want to bring in a piece of automation and look at the amount of work they got to do to the facility. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if you got to, if you're going to put in an ASRS. Oh yeah. I mean, all of a sudden the specs that your floor has to hit for flatness, for loading, et cetera, they end up cutting a big hole out of your floor and, you know, starting up again, yeah. you know, building a new foundation, pouring a new pad. I have to believe that as these technologies sort of become the way you do things, mm. that's going to have an influence on, you know, warehouse construction. I mean, it could be just as mundane as power. You can run a, a warehouse right now pretty much on single phase and, you know, maybe 220 for some motors. Well, guess what? Robots run, you know, three phase power. Mm. So. You know, uh, there's been a number of instances where we're like, OK, we're going to put this robot here. You, you got to bring in three phase. Oh, and we want an Ethernet drop yeah. because, you know, these robots all have to be connected. And they're like, oh, we hadn't considered that. And, mm. you know, the nearest trunk is way back over there. You know, so uh, it has to be the case that if you're going to have these uh, facilities be automated, you're going to have to make some provisions early, you know, for them. You know, if you were going to have a warehouse full of people, you would make sure there were enough restrooms, drinking fountains, you know, <laughs> the type of things that yeah. people need. Well, robots don't need those things, but they do need these other things. <laughs> and so you have to make provision for them. Mm. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense because, um, I mean, robots, they don't, they don't need the restroom obviously. Right. Um, well, they don't yet. need a parking yeah. spot either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Robot of the month, uh, parking spot. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think that makes total sense. I mean, I think as we see the, the evolution too, I mean, it, I think even in the, you know, developers mindset or, you know, some of these large like Prologis or something, property management yeah. companies, I mean, I think it's, it, it's going to be even more of a, 
probably an advantage at some point in, in their eyes to be able to put this type of infrastructure in place ahead of time, right? And have these kind of power requirements already available because I think it's going to, at some point it's going to become something that's just like expected, right? Like that's, yeah. you know, we're looking for a building and oh, your building doesn't have this. And, and I, I think there's some way to go there because I've been in buildings too that are new construction and, I'm like, you guys don't even have like power outlets set up at the dock doors. Like, uh, I mean, yeah. uh, what, what's going on here? And so, I, I mean, I think you're going to see more of that. And I think it'd be interesting to see kind of that, that evolution and, and development of what a, a green field, you know, type of building looks like and is set up as. And I think it's pretty, pretty interesting to hear too. I mean, I hear some buildings where, you know, they're going up to, you know, 80, 90 foot, 100 foot clear, like for some of these ASRS systems, pallet shuttle systems yeah. and things like that. It's kind of mind blowing to, to think about, honestly. Um, so, yeah. yeah and, uh, you know, being able to deal with that in a greenfield context means the cost is just nominal. It's incremental. Yeah. It's lost in the noise. Doing it in a brownfield is just much more intrusive. I mean, just think about the mezzanine. Oh, yeah. Right. If you had to, you know, right size the mezzanine for automation, the difference between that mezzanine and a mezzanine that was just human only, it's that much yeah. when you're doing it from the ground up. But if you have to go back and, you know, cut and drop legs and other things, all of a sudden it becomes a much more involved, you know, piece of work. So, yes, I encourage all of these, you know, supply chain consultants and, you know, the CBREs of the world, et cetera, be thinking about the technologies your tenants are going to be employing mm. and what how does that affect the, the choices you make in the construction yeah absolutely i think that's great advice there so it, very interesting talking to you eric and, and getting some of these perspectives now tell us a little bit about kind of i talked about plus one robotics a, a little bit here and there but i know you guys have had some some new announcements and things going on we mentioned the billion picks but tell us a little bit about kind of what's the the newest latest with plus yeah. one robotics and maybe what's what's coming in the future as well Sure. So just last week at the Automate show, we uh, formally introduced our Induct One system. Yeah. So again, in the parcel space, you, you can't slow the building down, right? So it's important that on a you know high speed sortation loop, whether it's a cross belt sorter or whatever it might be, to get as much rate and first pass yield out of that sorter as possible. So the vast majority of the systems in the world is one robot arm on a lane, right? Well, one robot arm is going to be limited into what its throughput is going to be. So, okay, well, what can we do to make the systems faster? Well, let's make the camera faster. Well, you know what? There's only so many milliseconds you're going to get out of that. Well, let's choose a faster robot. Well, you know what? There's only so many. The robots are only going to get so fast. Yeah. So ultimately, what do you got to do? You got to put two of them on there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so this is a two arm system that we have introduced. And I'll tell you, it took seven years because it took mm. all the learnings from that billion picks to build this machine. And Induct One is very well received in the market. I mean, we say it was formally introduced. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. But a lot of our customers had direct influence on the the you know sort of design and architecture of this machine but beautiful machine you know comes in it's configured so that it can be left hand right hand what side of the of the sorter is it on up on a mezzanine on the ground floor doesn't matter but the throughput is really really high mm -hmm. over 3000 you know picks per hour machine rate you know comfortably you know over 22 2300 picks in variable mix it's going to be a good machine for this market. And they need that. They're all clamoring for more volume per hour, right? The The cutoff windows aren't going to get any longer. The planes yeah. land and they're going to take off four hours later. That's not going to stretch. So you got to get more volume out uh, over the same duration. And this is uh, a good machine to do that. So we're excited about that. And I'll have to tell you, We've been very pleased with the sort of growth and adoption of our depalletizing software. Mm. So to us, a pallet isn't really much different than a parcel post project, right? It's yeah. all these different things. They're sitting in a pile and you got to get them out 
uh, of the pile. Well, you know, a pallet's just one of those. And so we built our software to, to do mixed depalletizing. If you've got single skew pallets, you don't need us. But if it's mixed, then all of a sudden uh, our technology comes to bear. And we've been very successful in our growth over the last six quarters on our depalletizing and more to come. So we'll have, you know, another bunch of systems deployed before peak of this year. And so looking for really good things out of depalletizing as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I think cause you know, sometimes uh, people would think as the, the mixed as the, the complicated part versus the single skew. Right. And you're saying like, don't give me the easy, right? <laughs> basically, right? Um, well, I mean, it's yeah. just we're over spec for it. Yeah. If it's if it's a single skew, you don't need vision. Just yeah. get a really big gripper, suck all of it up, and put it on a you know descramble it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and and layer pickers have been an established technology for a long time. Mm. But the truth is, the warehouses are getting away from single skew. Right. Everybody wants to have you know, fewer uh, shipments and the pallets being representative of what the store needs. Yeah. So it's all going to be mixed. Then all of a sudden those layer pickers stop adding value. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that makes sense, especially as we see the, the evolution of, you know, consumer desire and, you know, trying to be more efficient and, and get more, more out of less, as they say. And I think mm-hmm. it's great that you guys are addressing that and, and bringing these technologies to the industry and, and being able to, to help with that. And, and like you said, help increase that adoption a little more too, as we go into the future. So, so very interesting to talk to you here today, Eric, and very interesting to hear a little bit more about Plus One Robotics and, and what's going on with the latest with you guys with the dual arm there and congratulations on a, on a billion picks as well you know maybe the next time we'll talk we'll be at two billion potentially we'll see yes sir um but yes if people want to learn more about plus one robotics what's the best way to do that well definitely plus one robotics.com but i would encourage you to your you know audience to you know find us on linkedin mm-hmm. we're very active on the platform we have a bunch of opinionated engineers and folks here at Plus One. Uh, and so we are all the time talking about, you know, what we see in the market, what we see as, you know, successful things that uh, intrigue us and just trying to grow the warehouse automation community. Because as you pointed out, yeah, a million picks a day doesn't scratch the surface. Yeah. This market is still emerging. And the most important thing we do is educate one another. Mm. So, you know, thanks for this podcast, because it's part of it is, you know, this is a rising tide lifts all boats. It's in our interest that everyone be successful and leverage those successes across, because that's the way that we really make an impact. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I 100% agree with you. I think, you know, we can only make each other better through awareness and education. And uh, and I love that you guys are are taking an approach and effort to, to be able to do that for the industry. So thank you for that. So thank you so much, Eric, for joining me today and to learn more about Plus One Robotics and find those links that Eric mentioned, head to the com. And thank you once again for your time today, Eric. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.